All right, so yesterday we covered carbohydrates and lipids. Today we're going to talk about amino acids and nucleic acids, but let's start with amino acids. Amino acids are thought of as the building blocks of proteins. So typically when you look at a protein, it's made of a big chain of amino acids. However, there's really only about 20 natural amino acids or 20 common amino acids. There are synthetic amino acids that can be used, but really nature tends to use these base 20 ones. If you've ever been in a health food store, you maybe have seen liquid aminos. Has anybody seen that? It's in a squirt bottle. So sometimes if you're a vegetarian, you're deficient in certain amino acids, so you actually have to um, get them from sources like that. But let's take a look at the generic structure. And the generic structure of an amino acid looks like this, where you've got a nitrogen with a positive charge and three hydrogens a carbon that has some sort of R group on it, and we'll describe what that is. This can vary from amino acid to amino acid. And then over here we have a carboxylic acid that's lost its proton. So the interesting thing with amino acids is under physiological pH, that nitrogen has a positive charge and that oxygen has a negative charge. This is referred to as a zwitter ion. And like I said, a zwitter ion means it has both positive and negative charges on the same molecule. So what's the overall charge here, though? What do you think? It's neutral, right? They cancel out. So that's what makes a zwitter ion unique, is that it has a charge, but it's overall neutral. Um, the reason that this occurs is that nitrogens are really good bases, carboxylic acids are really good acids, so they shift the proton from the acid to the base site, and you end up with this witter ion. Does that make sense? When we think about the 20 common amino acids, really they just vary by that R group. So that R group could be a hydrogen, it could be a methyl group, it could be any number of various groups. I'm not expecting you to memorize all of the various amino acids. However, if you go on and take maybe biochemistry, you might have to. But let's take a look at the various R groups for some amino acids. And I'm just going to zoom in on this. And we won't spend a lot of time on this. But you can see all of the ones in green are amino acids. But if you look at all of these, they all have this NH3 group with the positive charge, right? So each of those is protonated, and then each of these has the deprotonated carboxylic acid, which they've condensed down to COO minus. So the green um, section basically differentiates all of these um, amino acids. If we look at the top of this table, it says these are all nonpolar amino acids. And why do you think they're nonpolar? Not necessarily. What I would say is if you look at the R group, the stuff highlighted in green, there really aren't any strong electron withdrawing atoms. That means that their side chain in the R group really doesn't have a big dipole to it. Um, if we look down at the next one, we've got basic and acidic amino acids. So you can actually have amino acids that are more acidic than others or more basic than others. It just kind of depends. And then with polar amino acids, you see how the polar amino acids tend to have some sort of electron withdrawing group, like an alcohol is really electron withdrawing. Got an alcohol here. What's this functional group? An amide, exactly. So we've got an amide, we've got an alcohol. Here we've got a thiol. It looks like an alcohol, but with sulfur. And then over here, we've got another amide. So we have a big diversity of amino acids out there. We've got some that are nonpolar, some that are polar, some that are basic, some that are acidic. We've got some that are hydrophobic. We've got some that are hydrophilic. That allows us to make proteins of uh, varying shapes and structures. So let's take a look at how we start making polypeptides or proteins. And 
and you can probably tell by the name that we've got poly in there. We're going to make some sort of polymer out of amino acids. So I'm just going to draw a generic amino acid. Like this. And then we'll do a second one in blue. And this one I'm actually going to draw out all of the hydrogens here. And this nitrogen still has a positive charge. So we've got a red amino acid and a black amino acid. Our goal is to link these together. So what we're going to essentially do, just like we saw with our condensation polymers, is we're going to circle these. I'm going to say, all right, this whole unit is going to be lost as water. And we can start to make a polymer. So your body is really, really good at making these. However, chemists can actually make these in a lab. So let's go ahead and draw this out. And so you can continue doing this over and over and over again. The cool thing is when we do this, we formed a new bond between those two amino acids. This bond has a very special name and it corresponds to the overall functional group. What's this functional group that we just made? We started out as a carboxylic acid and an amine. We mushed them together. What do we call a carbonyl that has a nitrogen attached? an amide. So what we have here is an amide linkage. So theoretically you can keep on extending this chain over and over and over again to hundreds of thousands of amino acids long to get a very large polypeptide. All right. The cool thing with this is the R groups can change, right? The identity can be one of 20 common amino acids. So you really have an infinite number of polypeptides that you could make depending on the order and sequence of amino acids and the identity of the R groups coming off of them, right? So down here, we've got a model that shows what this might look like for a given sequence of amino acids. And you can tell each of these, I'll highlight it right there, right here, right here, right here, right here, and so on, they're all connected connected by amide linkages, right? And the R groups coming off of them, this one has a methyl group, this one has this big long chain, this one just has a hydrogen, that one has a thiol, and then this one has an alkane, and then this one's got a big group. So we can kind of decorate this uh, polymer with uh, functionalized R groups. Does that make sense? All right, the interesting thing too is this is called the primary structure. And the primary structure is just the order of amino acids. So it basically just tells you they're connected in this specific order. However, proteins have higher order structures too. So we want to talk about that. It gets more complicated. So we have something called a secondary structure. And a secondary structure is really important for proteins in particular. Proteins are made up of polypeptides and these polypeptides will fold into a unique shape. Sorry, that should be will. And this is specifically due to H bonding. And hydrophobic effects. Alright, so 
So whether or not that particular amino acid likes water or doesn't like water, it might adopt a different shape. There's a handful of these that are pretty common in biology, and I'll show you. The first one is called an alpha helix. The next one is called a beta sheet. And then there's other ones. We're not going to get really into those, but you can have coils and other unique structures um, that are the three-dimensional folding or shape of a sequence of polypeptides. So how many of you have taken biology here? Fair number. So in biology, quite often, when you look at a protein, it'll look something like this. I'm trying to remember which protein this is. Can't off the top of my head. But what they're doing is they're showing you the shape, but not the individual atoms. So let's zoom in on this polypeptide. You see this coil here? What do you think that is? Not a beta sheet probably going to be an alpha helix, so a helix is something that spirals up like that. So this unique sh shape in this protein is due to an alpha helix. Looks like a corkscrew kind of. We're down here, it's a little hard to see. I'll do this one in green. You see how this one looks more like a ribbon going across? That would be a beta sheet. But all of these are due to H bonding features where the molecule will adopt a certain shape so that it can hydrogen bond to its neighbors in a particular way. We're really not going to get into it too much, but I did want to introduce it to you because if you go on and take higher level biology, you'll talk about it a lot more. All right. We also have to consider something called the tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure gets a bit more complicated. And that's the overall shape. Of a protein. So for example, the protein shown above had both beta sheets and alpha helices in it. The tertiary structure would be all of that combined together into the big three dimensional shape of a given protein. And in addition to that, we also have something called the quaternary structure. And a quaternary structure is multiple proteins or multiple polypeptides forming a complex. So for example, you might have different polypeptide strands kind of globbing together to form one massive protein structure. So you can see in the structure above, all of those different colors are actually different polypeptide sequences that have kind of mushed together to form one big complex protein structure. Does that make sense? All right, we also have one other really important function for proteins, and many of you have probably seen this in high school or in other science classes, but these are enzymes. And enzymes are really unique and cool proteins. They are a protein that catalyzes a chemical reaction. And does anybody know what it means to catalyze something? What do you think? Yeah, I think you're on the right track. So a catalyst is something that allows a reaction to occur, but ultimately isn't changed itself at the end of the reaction, if that makes sense. So let me write it in easier to understand terms. It speeds up chemical reactions. But does not get consumed. during the reaction. So let's take a look at this um, picture on the left. If you look at the picture on the left, the blue horseshoe is our 
uh, example enzyme. And it has this opening on the top where a substrate, meaning some other molecule, can actually dock on the inside. So the next thing in the middle shows the uh, substrate, meaning some sort of molecule docking with that enzyme in order to form an enzyme substrate complex. Enzymes oftentimes have these little scissors kind of built in. And so if we look at this, this enzyme might say, I'm going to cut right along there. And then when it's done cutting it, it kind of spits it back out. You now have two pieces of your substrate and your enzyme is returned to its normal state where it can do this over and over and over again. So if you remember when we talked about carbohydrates yesterday, I said we have enzymes in our bodies that help um, cleave those polypeptides, of, or sorry, those uh, polysaccharides into individual sugars. It goes through a process like this where an enzyme latches on, snips it, goes to the next spot, snips that, and so on. So these are basically like little machines in our body. They're kind of neat. Does that make sense? I know this is kind of a crash course, but if you take biology, you'll cover this in a lot more detail. All right, the next section that we have is nucleic acids. And nucleic acids come in two generic varieties, as polymers at least. The first one is DNA. And most of you have probably heard of this. This is deoxyribonucleic acid, hence the term D. N A. And does anybody know the other one that's pretty common in your body? RNA. And this is just ribonucleic acid. So you can tell it's RNA because there's no D at the front, it's just R, N, and A. The way I always describe these polymers, RNA and DNA, is that they are essentially the genetic hard drive of your body. They do have a variety of other functions. In fact, there are RNAs that can act as catalysts as well. We're not going to get into that um, too much, but for the most part, we can think of DNA and RNA as the stored information inside of your body. It tells your body how to make proteins. It tells your body what to do in certain circumstances. So maybe you've got a virus in you. You essentially have genetic information stored in your body, telling your body how to respond to that virus. It's pretty neat. Um, so our body is very good at storing information. Let's take a look at a nucleotide monomer. Meaning the individual piece of RNA or DNA. They do vary a little bit from RNA to DNA, but this is just a generic nucleotide. The main thing you should remember is in each of these you have a group coming off the end called a phosphate group. You don't have to be overly concerned with the absolute structure. I want you just to just remember that there's a phosphate group. And then in the middle here, got a sugar and this particular sugar is called ribose so with RNA in particular you would say that this is a ribonucleic acid it's not missing one of its oxy groups in particular if it were DNA it wouldn't have an OH in this position we'll talk about that in more detail so this is an RNA monomer and then over here we've got this blue segment coming off this is a nucleic acid base. And these bases like to pair up with other bases, so they'll actually link up um, and hydrogen bond together, especially with DNA. All right, so let's take a look at these nucleic acid bases in a bit more detail. And you don't have to worry about writing all of these down. Um, this is on OneNote, though, if you would like to use it as a reference later. But we've got a variety of different nucleic acid bases, depending on whether or not you're looking at DNA or RNA. And just to remind you, the nucleic acid base was the blue thing coming off of the sugar, right? So let's take a look at a bunch of these. And with DNA, 
if we look at DNA, DNA has a bunch of common base pairs. The first one is thymine, then adenine, then guanine, then cytosine. Those are all DNA base pairs. Where the difference is with RNA, you have three of the same base pairs. You got adenine, guanine, cytosine. However, instead of thymine, you actually have uracil. So let's take a look at kind of the pieces and how they compare to one another. So I'm going to do DNA over here. Actually, I'll make it in green. And then I'll do RNA in red. They're super, super similar. The main difference, like I said, was DNA. You have thymine that has the symbol T. But in RNA, that switches to uracil. They're very, very, very similar base pairs. The main difference between thymine and uracil is you're missing a methyl group coming off of it. So they're structurally very similar. The other three are identical. So you could have adenine, you could have guanine, and you could have cytosine. And again, we just use their first letter as a symbol. Same thing with RNA. You can have adenine, you can have guanine, and you can have cytosine. The other interesting difference between DNA and RNA is, let's zoom in on the sugar. If we look here, this one doesn't have an OH in this position. So no OH equals deoxyribose. So this would be found in DNA. Where in the one on the right hand side, this one has an OH. Which means that this is just a ribose sugar. And this is going to be found in RNA. So structurally, DNA and RNA are pretty similar, but they do have some minor differences. Primarily with the OH group and the sugar. And then secondarily, the base pair switches between thymine and uracil, depending on whether or not you're working with DNA or RNA. Does that make sense? I know this is a lot of info. All right. The cool thing with these is just like with amino acids, you can polymerize these into a really, really long chain, which is how we store all of our genetic information. And so I'll show you just kind of a symbolic representation of this. So nucleic acids polymerize into long chains. All right, the main thing to remember is that the backbone is always made up of your phosphate and sugar. So these repeat over and over again in your backbone. And then you have basically some bases dangling off. That's not the scientific term, though. <laughs> so those bases are kind of just sticking out into space looking for another base um, to bond to, essentially. So that's what we'll take a look at next, is how these bases interact with one another. But the bases really like to hydrogen bond with a complementary base. So let's take a look at how these base pairs um, hydrogen bond together. So we'll take a look at this. Over here, we've got two amino acids. On the left-hand side, we've got thymine. And on the right-hand side, we have adenine. So what we would call this is a Ta base pair. So T really likes the hydrogen bond to A and vice versa. A really likes the hydrogen bond to T. And we can take a look at the hydrogen bonds that are occurring here. So we've got a hydrogen bond here and a hydrogen bond there. So between thymine and adenine, you have two different hydrogen bonds holding them together to one another. They really like to stick together. Alternatively, on the other side, what we have is cytosine as the base pair on the left and then adenine, or sorry, guanine on the right. And so this would be a C-G base pair, or you can have a G-C base pair. Either way, it doesn't matter. 
And this one's unique because we end up having three different hydrogen bonds linking them together. So the main difference between these is a Ta base pair has two H bonds, where Cg has a three H bond system. Does that make sense? All right, now we get to talk a little bit about the history, and I'm going to rile some feathers, or ruffle some feathers. If we look at these two guys, they were the, quote, discoverers of DNA. Does anybody know their names? Watson and Crick. Um, they were the ones that published the first paper about the double helix uh, structure of DNA in particular. It was pretty cutting edge at the time. Prior to the discovery of DNA, there was debate about whether or not genetic information was stored in nucleic acids or in polypeptides. People disagreed. They thought maybe there's a chance that proteins store our genetic information and nucleic acids are just something else in our body. Um, they kind of came up with this theory that DNA in particular is the hard drive for all of the genetic information in your body. The reason I like to bring this up is they are pretty controversial figures, in particular the guy on the right. He is known to be a racist, so I'll just write that down. <laughs> a lot of these, I mean, being a white male chemist, it frustrates me seeing other racist white male chemists out there. They kind of sullied the name of um, genetics for a while, basically claiming that certain people were predisposed to have better genetics than other people, and um, that if you were of certain ethnicities, you weren't likely to be as smart as a Caucasian, and so I really don't care for him. Um, the other thing that really kind of irritates me about these two is they didn't actually discover the structure of DNA. Does anybody know who did? It was a woman. Rosalind Franklin. So if you think about DNA in the future, try to remember her name. She should have won the Nobel Prize. She did all of the legwork and basically just got like a little note at the bottom of the publication saying, oh yeah, this woman did some work for us, whatever. Um, but she did all of the crystallography work that helped solve this incredibly complicated problem. She deserves a huge amount of credit. And unfortunately, she died at a really young age um, from cancer. And that had to do with the fact that back then, they didn't really understand how harmful x-rays were. And so she was exposed to a lot of radiation and ended up dying um, essentially from doing her work. Um, but interesting story. Whenever you see your um, biology textbooks listing Watson and Crick, remember they're half the story and not a very good half, the better half is her story. <laughs> so they were the ones um, that as a team, and she did most of the work, um, um, basically found the structure. All right, so just to kind of rehash all of this, we've got DNA versus RNA. DNA tends to be double-stranded, and like I said, it's a deoxyribose sugar in DNA. That just means it's missing an OH coming off one of the sugars. And it has the base pairs C, G, A, and T, where RNA has that OH group. RNA tends to be single-stranded, although sometimes it's not. Um, and then the other big difference is instead of the thymine, it has a uracil base pair. So other than that, they're pretty similar to one another. Does that make sense? Pretty interesting stuff. What we're finding out more and more too, um, I remember this bugged me a lot when I took biology, is my biology instructor said, most of your DNA is non-coding garbage DNA. And that really bugged me because we had just learned about evolution prior to that, and evolution doesn't like carrying baggage with it. Typically, if you've got some useless trait, it's just not passed down because why carry it down through uh, generations? The reality is we're finding out that a lot of the non-coding DNA and RNA in our body is incredibly important for gene regulation, and that's what we'll talk about next. So next, we're going to talk about how proteins and um, DNA and RNA are all related. So specifically, this comes from the central dogma of biology. And this was something that chemists worked on in the 50s along with biologists. 
What the theory is that still holds today is that DNA gets converted to another type of uh, or a nucleic acid called mRNA. And then mRNA gets converted to proteins. However, each of these transitions has a unique step involved. So the first step from DNA to mRNA is called transcription. Basically saying we're going to transcribe DNA to RNA using a unique enzyme. So they're just uh, uh, changing it from one form to another. Yep. Why is it mRNA? That's a good question. In fact, let's talk about that now. Does anybody know what the M stands for? Messenger. Messenger. And we'll talk about that. But essentially, it's just a special type of RNA whose job it is to move the RNA from one part of a cell to another part of a cell. So it kind of floats through the nucleus out into the um, cytoplasm. Yep. So this just means messenger. And then what we have to do is we have to convert from the language of nucleic acids to the language of polypeptides. And in order to do that, we have to translate it, right? So you should think of translate with changing languages. So we're going from the language of nucleic acids to the language of proteins. Okay, so let's kind of take a look at what's going on in here. So what we've got on the top is we've got a cell nucleus. So this is our nucleus. And this holds DNA. If you've ever had a chance to look at cells under a microscope, you can often stain the nucleus and it looks like just kind of a little spot on the inside of the cell. It bundles up a bunch of DNA and just holds it there for long-term storage. What happens though is we end up reading that DNA using a special enzyme and we can convert that to messenger RNA. So mRNA gets produced in the nucleus, and then that messenger RNA essentially gets shuttled out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And inside your cytoplasm, you have this unique organelle called a ribosome, and the ribosome will actually latch onto that mRNA, and then a bunch of other RNAs will come basically read it and then form a big link of proteins. Um, the other RNA that's commonly used for this process is called transfer RNA. This is also known as tRNA. It just makes it a little bit easier um, to write down. So the transfer RNA basically reads the messenger RNA. The cool thing with transfer RNA is it has amino acids kind of stuck on their tails. So every time it reads the messenger RNA, that amino acid on its tail will link up to another amino acid, and then so on, and then so on, and then so on. So this can go on for quite a while. So that's kind of the crash course of the central dogma. But let's kind of summarize it. The general summary is that DNA codes for mRNA. mRNA pairs with transfer RNA. And then transfer RNA pieces together polypeptides. So it's kind of this three-step process. So this is the three-step process. I'll just write that down. It's a little bit weird to think about, but it's pretty steppy. All right. So let's take a look at kind of the more involved process. So let's say I have DNA. And I've got a base pair that's a C. We have to have a complement. Oh. Wait, no, that was right. RNA. I don't know why that looked funny. All right. So if we've got a base pair, maybe it's cytosine on DNA. What should the base pair be for mRNA that complements C? What was that? G. All right. So you have to have complementary base pairs. And then if you think about going back to tRNA, tRNA has a base pair on it that needs to complement it. So what will its base pair be in order to complement the mRNA? Have to be C. 
So basically, it's this handoff between DNA's information to mRNA and then mRNA to tRNA. It's kind of um, weird that way. Let's do another one. What happens if DNA has G? What will mRNA be? C? And then what will tRNA be? G. Okay, let's try a couple more. We'll throw in a curveball. All right. DNA, let's say it has an A base pair. What will the mRNA be? So a lot of people will say T. That's a complementary base pair for DNA. It would be U because we can't have a T base pair in RNA. So we have to swap that out for U. So it can't be T in RNA. Switch to U. All right, and then going from mRNA to tRNA, what will we go back to? A, exactly. So U and A compare just like A and T compare. All right, and then on the very bottom, we'll do T. What happens with T? What will the mRNA be? A. We can have A's in RNA. And then going from mRNA to tRNA, what should it switch to? The U, right? We can't have a T and RNA, so we'll just put a little asterisk there and saying that's kind of the odd exception. <laughs> Your body made these rules. I didn't make these rules. All right. <laughs> so let's talk a bit more about tRNA. tRNA is a bit more complicated. tRNA has a three base pair codon. And a codon just means three particular um, base pairs in a row, right? So it has, oh, I did not write three. <laughs> Sorry, sometimes when I, I'm talking and writing, my dyslexia tends to shine through. All right, and the goal with this three uh, uh, base pair sequence is to find a matching or complementary uh, sequence, right? So in this case, you have to find a complementary mRNA sequence. All right, so for example, up here in this picture, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. This top strand is mRNA, and then down here, what we have is our tRNA codon. But the whole goal is to find that CG pair or AU pair. So you can see the G match with the C, the U match with the A, and the A match with the U in order for these to dock correctly with one another. And then coming off the end, you have this amino acid. So this amino acid coming off the tRNA for this one is uh, valine. And then each tRNA has a specific amino acid stuck to it. And these amino acids get linked together to form long polypeptides. All right, we're not going to get into this too much because it's something you'll cover more in biology. But I did want to show you kind of how this works, and we'll see a video. But when you have mRNA out, these tRNAs will dock. And then when you have two tRNAs docked on the same mRNA strand right next to each other, they'll actually link those two polypeptides together. Then the first one will let go after it's lost its amino acid. One will install on the next side, and then so on and so on. It's almost like a zipper going all the way down your mRNA chain, and it happens super fast. So let's take a look at this video that I have, because it is a fairly abstract process to think about, and I'll get the sound going too.
Oops, sorry, I was trying to get rid of that pop-up. It starts with a bundle of factors ascending at the start of the chain. This leads to trigger the first phase of the process, handing off the information that will be needed to make the program. A gene is the length of DNA stretching into the lab. Everything ready to work. Is this a model? This is a computer model, yeah. The blue molecules racing along the DNA remaining the DNA. It's unwilling to develop DNAs and copying one of the two strains. Sorry about that pop-up. The yellow chain sticking out of the car is a copy of the genetic message. And it's made of a close chemical cousin of DNA called RNA. The building blocks to make the RNA enter through a nuclear hole. They are matched to the DNA, letter by letter, to make an exact copy of the A's, C's, G's, and T's of the gene. The only difference is that in the RNA copy, the letter T is replaced with a closely related nucleic acid known as U. You are watching this process called transcription in real time. It's happening right now in almost every cell in the body. When the RNA copy is complete, it snakes away from the nucleus and clings to the outer part of the cell. All right, so it's kind of interesting. Like I said, if you go on and take biology courses, you'll learn about this in a lot more detail. Usually at this point in Chem 110, students will freak out and they'll say, do I need to know everything in fine detail for the final? I want you to know the general concepts. My goal is to ensure that you're prepared for your future biology courses, because I know a lot of people here are taking biology um, in the future. So like I said with the final, um, try to go through the practice final this weekend. That way if you have questions, you can come in on Monday ready to ask those questions. Um, I'll post the uh, final exam key on Monday. So don't panic if you don't see it this weekend on the course website. I just don't like posting it. Otherwise, students are tempted to just open it up and not do the work themselves. The final exam key. The practice final exam key, not the real final exam key. <laughs>